us today. Don't forget that next Sunday, Lord willing, we will be back in Mead, Kansas, and we will be again bringing a lesson from there as we start 2021. Thank you once again to the church here in Davenport for allowing us to record these lessons, and thankful, thank you, Ron, for presenting these lessons from the Word of God for us. Good morning. Good morning. Our lesson is from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, starting in verse 13, all the way through chapter 5, verse 8. Probably not as long as it seems like it might be. 2 Corinthians 4, starting in verse 13, through chapter 5, verse 8. And I've entitled the lesson, Courage for the Conflict. In 2 Corinthians 4, verse 13, Paul says, It is written, I believe, therefore I have spoken. And with that same spirit, we also believe and therefore speak. Now the phrase that Paul uses, spirit of faith, means attitude or outlook of faith. Paul's not referring to the gift of faith, which is a miraculous gift spoken of in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 9, but rather to that attitude of faith that ought to belong to each one of us as, as Christians. Paul identified himself with Psalms 116, verse 10, where it says, I believe and therefore I have spoken. True witness for God is based on faith in God, and that faith comes from the Word of God, Romans 10, verse 17. <laughs> Nothing closes a believer's mouth like unbelief. So what was Paul so confident about? Well, he was confident that he had nothing to fear from life or death. He just listed some things, some of the trials that he had been part of his life in ministry. Paul actually talks about that quite a bit in his, in his epistles. Uh, and now he was affirming that his faith gave him victory over all of them. Uh, this morning we're going to look at six assurances uh, that Paul uh, spoke of uh, because of his faith. First assurance, uh, Paul was sure of ultimate victory, and we can be sure of ultimate victory. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 14, Because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you in his presence. Jesus Christ has conquered death. Uh, this is the last enemy. God raised Jesus from the dead. Why fear anything else? You know, people will do anything they can to uh, understand death and prepare for it, and yet the world has no answer. Until a person is prepared to die, he is not really prepared to live. But the message of Jesus Christ is victory over death. We need to remember that victory, that, that victorious emphasis. And note also that Paul saw a future reunion of God's people when he wrote, and present us with you, in verse 14. We are going to be there with the saints of the ages. It's us with you, Paul would say. Death is a great divider, but in Jesus Christ, there's assurance that his people will be reunited in his presence. 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 through 18. Second assurance, he was sure that God would be glorified. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 15. All of this for your benefit, so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. Now this verse... Uh, is parallel to Romans 8, verse 31, which says, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. And what, is, what does this mean? This gives us assurance that whatever happens to us uh, is not wasted. God uses them to minister to others and also to bring glory to his name. So how is God glorified in our trials? It's glorified by giving us the grace we need to maintain joy and strength when the going gets difficult. Remember to Paul, he said in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9, My grace is sufficient for you, and my power is made perfect in weakness. And Paul had talked about the fact that we are weak. We are weak uh, earthen vessels. We're jars of clay. We're very fragile. But the treasure within us is very valuable. And God uses our weakness to show his power. Third assurance, he was sure that his trials were working for him 
and not against him. 2 Corinthians 4, verses 16 and 17, Therefore we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Now, the theme in chapter 4 is summed up in these words, we do not lose heart. Verse 1 mentions it, and, the, and, and verse 16 mentions it. Uh, this was Paul's confident testimony. What does it matter if the outward person is wasting away so long as the inward person is e being experiencing daily spiritual renewal? Now, Paul's not suggesting that the body's not important or that we should not take care of our body. Our bodies are the temples of God, according to what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 6, verse 16. We need to care for our bodies, but we cannot control the natural deterioration of the human nature. All of us get old. All of us uh, deteriorate. When we consider all the physical trials that Paul endured, it's no wonder that he wrote as he did. You know, as Christians, we must live a day at a time. No person, no matter how wealthy or gifted, can live two days at a time. God provides for us day by day as we pray to him. If you remember the Lord's Prayer in Luke 11, verse 3, it is, give us each day our daily bread. And in Matthew 6, verse 30, Jesus said, therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. And there are people who worry and worry and worry about what the future holds. And yes, we should worry enough to do the things we can do, uh, but we cannot control what happens tomorrow. We need to live we need to live today, and we need to live for the Lord today. When we learn to live a day at a time, confident of God's care, it takes away a great deal of pressure. They used to have this saying, yard by yard, life is hard, inch by inch, life's a cinch. And when you live by faith in Christ, you get the right perspective on suffering. Notice the contrast that Paul presented in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 17. He speaks of light and momentary troubles. Then he speaks of eternal glory that outweighs them all. So momentary, eternal, working against us, working for us. Paul's writing, Paul is, was writing with eternity's values in, in mind. He was weighing the present trials against the future glory, and he discovered that his trials were actually working against him. In Romans 8, verse 18, he says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Now, we need to not misunderstand this principle and think that a Christian can live any way he wants to and expect everything to turn out to the glory of God. Paul's writing about trials and life that's experienced while you're doing the will of God, while you're trying to be a Christian. He was thinking, he was thinking of those of us as we are doing the work of God. God does and can, uh, can and does turn suffering into glory, but he cannot turn sin into glory. Sin must be judged because there's no glory in sin. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 16 should be related to 2 Corinthians 3, verse 18, because both uh, verses have to do with the spiritual renewal of the child of God. In chapter 4, verse 16, he says, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day, while 2 Corinthians 3, verse 18 says, are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory. And so even though we suffer, we are being renewed day by day with ever-increasing increasing glory and becoming more and more like our Lord. That, that's what Christianity is all about, is becoming more and more like our Lord, being conformed to his image. Of itself, suffering will not make us holier men or women. Unless we yield to the Lord, Turn to his word and trust in him to work. Our suffering could make us far worse Christians. I've been in the church all my life. I was an elder in New York for 20 years. I've seen some, some of God's people grow critical and bitter and go from bad to worse instead of ever increasing glory. So we need that spirit of faith that Paul mentioned in 2 Corinthians 4 verse 13. The fourth assurance, he was sure... Uh, the invisible world was real. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 18. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. 
For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. We need to think about the fact that the invisible world described in the Bible is really the only real world. This is what is spoken of in Hebrews 11, verses 9 and 10, when the writer speaks of Abraham in the Old Testament. He says, By faith he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign land. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. Elsewhere it says, he never, he never received the promises while he was alive. The promises he, already, he received after he was, after he was dead and went, went to be with God. This world that we live in is at best temporary and decaying. And while we find it attractive and use it for our enjoyment, it's full of troubles and trials, and we will find its attractiveness fleeting. If we could only see the visible world the way God wants us to see it, we would never be attracted by what it offers. The great men and women of faith mentioned in Hebrews 11 achieved what they did because they saw the invisible, Hebrews 11, verses 13 through 16. The things of this world seem so real because we can see them and we can feel them with our physical bodies, but they're all temporary, temporary and destined to pass away. Only the eternal things of the spiritual life will last. But again, we must not press this truth into uh, extremes and think that material and spiritual oppose each other. God created the world and all that we see for our benefit, and he wants us to use it and enjoy it. It was a perfect world, perfect for us in every way, until sin came into the world. Then what was perfect became blighted and, and imperfect and became what we see today with all the troubles the world has. And yet, you look out at the world and you see the beauty of, God, of God's creation shining through even with all of the things that sin brought about. If we cling to the things of this world, they will fail us. But if we put our hope in God, it will never fail us. So how can we look at things that are invisible? It is by faith. When we read the word of God, we see things that are invisible and we understand things that God has in store for us. None of us have seen Jesus, none of us have seen heaven, and yet we know they're real because the word of God tells us so. Faith is the evidence of things not seen, Hebrews 11.1. 1. Because Abraham looked for the heavenly city, he separated himself from Sodom. Uh, but Lot chose Sodom because he walked by sight and not by faith. He looked at the well-watered plains. He said, boy, I can make a lot of money there. And that's why he moved in to Sodom. Abraham was not fooled by that. He was looking for a city that God had made that was promised to him. Of course, the unworld, the unsaved world thinks we're odd, maybe even crazy, because we insist on the reality of the invisible world of spiritual blessing. And yet, as Christians, we're content to give our, give our lives by eternal values, not by temporal uh, prices. And then the fifth assurance, we have a future hope. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 1. Now we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. So what do we have? Paul says, we have a building of God. Verse 1 here in chapter 5. Now before he had said, we have this ministry in chapter 4, verse 1. We have this treasure in chapter 4, verse 7. And we have the same spirit of faith, chapter 4, verse 13. This is a wonderful testimony that Paul gave to the reality of the Christian faith. This building of God is not the believer's heavenly home, promised in John 14, verses 1 through 6. It is the believer's glorified body. Paul was a tent maker. We read about it in Acts 18, verses 1 through 3. Uh, and here he used a tent as a picture of our present earthly bodies. Now a tent, you all know about tents. A tent is a weak, tempor temporary structure without much beauty. But the glorified body that we will receive will be eternal, beautiful, uh, will never show signs of weakness or decay, Philippians 3, verses 20 and 21. Paul saw the human body 
as a jar of clay. In chapter 4, verse 7, uh, as an earthen vessel, other versions say, as a temporary tent. But he knew that believers would one day receive a wonderful glorified body suited to the glorious environment of heaven. It's interesting to trace Paul's testimony in this paragraph. First thing he says in verse 1 is, we know. So how do we know? We know because we trust the word of God. No Christian ever has to uh, go to a fortune teller, get a, a Ouija board, a spiritualist, or a deck of cards, or read their uh, astrology report in the newspaper to find out what the future holds, uh, what lies on the other side of death. God has told us all that we need to know in the pages of his word. So Paul's we know connects with his because we know in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 14, and this relates to the resurrection of Jesus. We know that he is alive, therefore we know that death cannot claim us. Because I live, he says, Jesus says in John 14, 19, because I live, you also will live. The fact that God raised Jesus from the dead is a promise that he will raise us from the dead. If our tent is destroyed, and what that means is if we die, if it's taken down, we need not fear. The body is only a temporary home that we live in. When a believer dies, the body goes to the grave, but the spirit goes to be with Jesus. Philippians 1, verses 20 through 25. When Jesus returns for his own, he will raise the dead bodies in glory, and the body and spirit will be joined together and for a glorious eternity in heaven. Second phrase he uses is, we groan. Second Corinthians 5, verses 2 through 5. Meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling. Because we were, when we were clothed, we will not be found naked. For while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now it is God who made us for this very purpose and has given us the Spirit as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. Now Paul is not being morbid here. Uh, sometimes we read this and you could take it that way, I guess, but Paul is not being morbid. In fact, his statement is really just the opposite. Paul was eager for Jesus to return so that he would be clothed in the glory, glorified body. He presented us with three possibilities using the image of the body as a tent. One is alive, we're residing in the tent. This is where we live. Number two is dead, that is unclothed. We're out of the tent. He also used the word naked. Okay. The third is clothed, and what he means by that, we have been transformed into the body, the, the glorified body at the return of Christ. Paul was hoping that he would be alive uh, and on earth at the return of Christ so that he might not have, have to go through the experience of death. I think all of the writers in the New Testament uh, were expecting Jesus to return in their lifetime. I mean, we're supposed to be expecting him to return any time. That's been true uh, throughout <clears throat> from the time that Jesus uh, ascended to heaven. We're all expecting his return. And Paul was no different. He expected Jesus' return. Uh, the glorified body is called a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 1. And then in verse 2, it's called our heavenly dwelling. This is in contrast to our mortal bodies, which came from the dust of the ground. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 49, it says, And just as we have borne the likeness of of the earthly man, the earthly man would be referring to Adam, so shall we bear the likeness of the man from heaven. And that, of course, is Jesus. Just like we are like Adam, we are going to be like Jesus. Okay? Uh, 1 John chapter 5, verse 2 uh, talks about this. What we will be has not been made known. What, what's going to happen to us has not been made known, uh, but uh, when he appears... We shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. The promise is, we may not understand fully what we're going to be like, but we're going to be like Jesus. And the only picture we have of Jesus in the glorified body is his resurrection appearances. And he's in a body that 
can eat, can be touched. He can move into a locked room uh, without having to unlock the door seemingly. And maybe we're going to be something like that. I don't know, but we're going to see him and we're going to be, be like him. Now it's important to note that Paul was not groaning because he was in a human body. He was groaning because he loved, he longed to see the Lord Jesus and received the glorified body. And so Paul was groaning for glory. And this explains why death holds no terrors for the Christian. None of us want to die. God made us so we didn't want to die. He made us so we take care of ourselves. Okay? God wants us to live. But we have a very temporary existence. And, uh, and so we need to realize we all have an appointment. We're all going to die, either soon or sooner or later. Even later is not very long. Uh, we have a lady in York that's 105 years old, and that's wonderful. But that's just a blink of the eye. You ask her how long it was since she was a child, she said, well, just, just, it just seemed like only, only a few minutes ago. <clears throat> and all of us are that way. You know, Paul called his death a departure. In 2, Corinthians, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6. Verse 6. One meaning of the Greek word departure is to take down the 110 and move on. Okay? Whenever you decided to move out, you the Roman soldiers took down their tents and took off. Okay? And so uh, we're going to take down our tents and move on. That's what departure is. But how can we be sure that we will we will one day have new bodies like the glorified body of our Savior? Paul tells us. He tells us how we can be sure. Paul mentioned the sealing and the guarantee of the Spirit back in 2 Corinthians 1, verse 22. Look also at Ephesians 1, verses 13 and 14. The Holy Spirit dwelling in the believer's body is the down payment. It's the guarantee of future inheritance, including the glorified body. Now, in Greek, the word translated guarantee sometimes is used in a different way. Uh, sometimes it's used of, a, of an engagement ring. When you give your the, the girl that you want to marry an engagement ring, that's in effect a guarantee that I'm going to, I'm going to marry you. Okay, and so we could think of the spirit as uh, a, a <coughs> engagement ring. The church could be thought of as being engaged to Jesus Christ and is waiting for the bridegroom to come and take her to the wedding. Revelation chapter 21. The sixth. The sixth assurance, and the final assurance, uh, we have confidence. Paul says in verses 6 through 8, Therefore we are always confident. He uses that word, always confident. And know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. We live by faith, not by sight. Notice again, we are confident. I say, and I would, and would prefer to be away from the body and be at home with the Lord. Now, the people of God can be found one of two places, either in heaven or on earth. Ephesians 3, verse 15. <clears throat> none of them are in the grave. None of them are in hell. None of them are in any, in any intermediate place between heaven and hell. Believers on earth, according to Paul, are at home in the body. Verse 7. While believers who have died are away from the body. Verse 8. Believers on earth are away from the Lord. Verse 7 while believers in heaven are at home with the Lord, verse 8. Because we have this kind of confidence, uh, Paul was not afraid of suffering and trial or even dangers. And we need to have the same confidence. We have, we have wonderful, wonderful blessings promised from God. And we need to be confident and not be afraid of what goes on in our life. Yes, life can be tough, but we can get through it with God's help. Now, this is not to suggest that Paul or any of us should take unnecessary risks. But it does mean that Paul was willing even to lose his life if he needed to for the sake of Christ and for the ministry of the gospel. He was walking by faith, not by sight. He looked at the eternal, unseen, not the temporal, seen. Heaven was not simply a destination for Paul. It was a motivation like the heroes of faith in Hebrews 11, he looked for the heavenly city and governed his life by eternal values. Now we've looked through chapter 4 and started in chapter 5, and as we review this section, we can see how Paul had courage for the conflict. 
and would not lose heart. He had a glorious ministry that transformed lives. He had a valuable treasure, an earthen vessel and a clay jar of his body. All of us, all of us who live in clay jars, but in, in effect, but all of us have the wonderful blessings of the gospel of Christ within us. We have Christ living within us. He wanted to share that treasure with the perishing world. He also had a confident faith that conquered fear and he had a future hope that was both a destination and a motivation. It's no wonder that Paul was more than a conqueror and we can be more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. Every believer in Jesus Christ has these same marvelous possessions and can find through them courage for the conflict. The lesson is yours if you would stand and have an invitation to follow.